Ahoy, 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 Kevin Booth be here. And we are at 30 degrees 20 minutes north and 71 degrees 11 minutes west, if that means much to you. Um, you might recall yesterday's video blog, we were around 30 north and 71 west. And uh, that's because for most of the past 24 hours we've been becalmed. Uh, we've managed to eke out about 28 miles over the past 24 hours. Um, but as you can see, we've picked up a little bit of wind now. We got about six to eight knots out of the south-southwest. And uh, the boat has picked up some speed. We're up to about three to four knots. Uh, instead of doing about half a knot to 1.5 knots, which is uh, what we've been doing for about the past two and a half days. Um, and uh, looking at the weather forecast, um, it looks like we're going to have gradually building winds toward the end of the week and in fact it could get pretty brisk as we get into Friday up 20-30 knots. Um, that's not a big concern for this boat just uh, though if the winds get up around 30 it will get rather uncomfortable. Uh, however it is a bit of a concern only because that's when we will probably be in the vicinity of or crossing the Gulf Stream. Um, and um, as a general rule, the Gulf Stream is not any place you want to be around in rough conditions. Um, now, in uh, conversations I've had with a lot of people, uh, both sailors and non-sailors, I find a lot of people have they've heard of the Gulf Stream but don't really know what it is. Um, so I thought today's tutorial will be on the Gulf Stream. Um, and this will be the Gulf Stream from a sailor navigator point of view. I'm sure a um, uh, marine biologist would have a very different uh, have a very different take on the Gulf Stream. But uh, this is uh, the Gulf Stream from a sailor's point of view. So what is the Gulf Stream? The Gulf Stream is basically a river running in the middle of the ocean. Um, it comes from the Gulf of Mexico, hence the name. And uh, the, the current flows out through the Straits of Florida, more or less goes up along the east coast to Cape Hatteras, and then it veers off to the east-northeast, and uh, it gets broader and weaker, but uh, the water works its way all the way over to, uh, to England and Europe. And um, so, if you, so if you just look at this uh, tattered old printout here, you can see the black line is the proximate axis of the Gulf Stream, and this moves around uh, from month to month, year to year, but generally, this is the general course of the Gulf Stream. So you can see here, we got the, uh, here we got, comes out through the Straits of Florida, and it moves up the East Coast, up to about Cape Hatteras, this is the Chesapeake Bay. And then it begins to curve off to the east northeast and sometimes meanders around. So this is uh, this is Cape Cod. This is New York right here. Um, and then just heads off across the Atlantic to uh, to England. Um, this river is well, where we're going to cross it is generally somewhere between about 30 and 60 miles wide, and the current varies usually between about uh, two and a half to three and a half knots at its strongest at the axis. Um, so it's a fair bit of current, and uh, it can certainly, uh, for a boat like this that's fairly slow moving, you know, we're doing uh, four or five knots or so, uh, it can take us a fair, fair ways off our, co off our course, um, especially if we get light winds like this, we could easily, we could easily get dragged 50 miles uh, by the time we get across to the other side of the Gulf Stream. Now. The reason the Gulf Stream is dangerous is for several reasons. Uh, one is simply that you have this strong river current uh, interacting with the ocean. Um, and in, in, um, in rough conditions where there's a lot of wind, this can generate all kinds of chaotic sea conditions. 
Um, the biggest danger is if the wind is blowing against the direction of the Gulf Stream. So east to northeast winds and the current is flowing to the east or northeast against the wind. Uh, that can generate very steep uh, breaking seas, almost like the waves you see coming up on a beach. Um, and uh, if, if the winds are strong enough up gale force, uh, it could, uh, those conditions can be dangerous for a small boat like this. Um, so, um, so, the, so the Gulf Stream is something you want to be careful of and generally uh, the strategy for crossing the Gulf Stream is to always try to steer 90 degrees to the current uh, simply to get to the other side of it as quickly as possible. Um, uh, another thing about the Gulf Stream is uh, it is prone to quite squally weather. Uh, you can, I've seen some, uh, some very awesome and frightening thunderstorms in the Gulf Stream. Um, so you, you can get all kinds of uh, what uh, the weather guys would call convection activity in and around the Gulf Stream. Um, so the Gulf Stream can be, uh, can be quite challenging. So I've crossed the Gulf Stream when it's been pretty much like this, uh, just cheerful, sunny, practically like a lake. Uh, but it can get quite rough. And, uh, and as I said, in, um, in certain conditions, it can become dangerous to small craft. Um, and there are, uh, there, there are plenty of horror stories about people who've gotten caught in the wrong weather in the Gulf Stream. Um, OK, so that's it for today's video blog. There's your FYI on the Gulf Stream. Uh, as you can see, it's another beautiful day out on the Atlantic Ocean here. Uh, the ocean's very calm and peaceful right now. Uh, it sounds like we are going to get a little more wind to speed us on our way. So all is well. Uh, as I say, uh, we've got to monitor this weather situation as we're approaching the Gulf Stream um, and see how that develops. So people often ask me how I manage my watch system at sea. Uh, it is of course of paramount importance to keep a sharp lookout at all times. Um, however, as a solo sailor, this, this is not possible. Because uh, of course uh, at some time I need to catch up on my sleep. Um, now one, one piece of technology that's come along lately that uh, that's really a big help for us solo sailors as well as everyone else is uh, AIS, which stands for Automatic Information System. Um, most vessels have AIS transponders these days. Um, all the big vessels are required by law to have them, any vessel over 300 tons. And, uh, and the way that works is it essentially pings on a VHF frequency, and I can pick it up on my VHF radio. Um, and let me just demonstrate that for you. Okay, so this is my VHF radio with an AIS receiver. And I have it in AIS mode here. You can see there's a target here and I have the range set at 10 nautical miles, so the outermost ring is 10 nautical miles from me. And any contacts will show up as icons on this target. And you can see we have one contact right here, there's a little icon. Uh, so what I can do is I can go to list, and it'll list the contacts, in this case just one. And there's a ship named Balsa 82. If I click on info, this will give me the name, it'll give me the distance, present distance from me which is 3.7 nautical miles. It's bearing, which is 250, so it's basically bearing west-southwest from us. And it's CPA, which is closest point of approach, which right now is also 3.7 nautical miles. So this ship is not, uh, assuming we both maintain course and speed, it's not going to get any closer than 3.7 nautical miles to us. And we can scroll down, it'll give it its speed over ground, its course over ground, and its heading. Now one very useful thing of this AIS receiver is that I can go to AIS setup and I can go to CPA alarm. Remember that the CPA closest point of approach is the closest point at which the projected paths of my boat and, and the, uh, the contact boat uh, will come within each other assuming we maintain course and speed. Um, so right now I have that limp, I have the alarm 
set at one nautical mile and the alarm is on. So anytime our projected pads come within one nautical mile of each other, it'll sound this alarm. And that alarm is quite loud and it is uh, it has roused me out of some deep slumbers uh, more than once. So that's a great safety feature for uh, solo sailors like myself uh, when we're catching up on sleep. Uh, at least there's some assurance that uh, if we're going to get very close to another ship or potentially on collision courses, uh, that I that it, I will be woken up and uh, be able to uh, take action before it's too late. So probably your greatest safety factor at sea is uh, statistics. Uh, the ocean is very wide, it's very vast. Uh, the chances of you colliding with anything at sea are, are quite small. Um, and of course here I'm just talking about offshore sailing. I'm not talking about coastal or uh, sailing on the Chesapeake Bay, which I've made some overnight passages up and down the Chesapeake Bay. And in those cases, I really cannot sleep at all. Um, I set an egg timer for 10, for 10 minutes at most. Um, and um, I have to keep waking myself up just because there's, there's so much shipping and um, so many things you could potentially collide with or places you could go aground. Um, but offshore at sea, generally I will sleep for about an hour, uh, sometimes a couple hours when I get to my, my, uh, my deep sleep cycles. Um, I sleep down below in my bunk um, and uh, what I will do is then I will wake myself up and uh, I'll come up the companion way, I'll check the compass course, um, check the sails, the wind vane, sweep around the horizon, and if everything looks okay, then I'll go back to sleep. Um, obviously, it's, this also varies with weather. Um, in bad weather, generally, it's hard to sleep much anyway. Um, in good weather, I'll tend to sleep more. I'll tend to catch up on my sleep. Um, and uh, so in that way, I manage, I manage to get enough sleep offshore so that um, I'm awake and alert and uh, have energy um, have energy to have the energy to uh, to operate the boat. Uh, at sea, you're never going to be able to sleep an entire night through like you would uh, when when you're in port. We can go to bed at ten and wake up at six, seven, seven in the morning. Um, that that's 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 not a luxury you have out here. Uh, even if you have other people on board, you're sharing the watch system with. Um, it simply can't work that way. Um, so at any rate, that's all I wanted to say on that subject. I uh, hope that was informative and uh, well, we'll talk to you again soon. Peace everyone. As you can see, we've had a bit of pickup in the wind here. It's Wednesday, June 14th. And, uh, I'm guessing this is this, uh, this is this cold front that's moving over us right now. As you can see behind us, there's a, a squall line that just went over us. Um, and just generally low clouds here, which would be consistent. And plus the pickup in the wind would be consistent with the passage of a cold front. Uh, right now we got about 20 knots, kind of with the kind of 18 to 22 knots. Um, I don't see any big swells, so that's consistent with uh, this is mainly a, this frontal boundary is mainly an area of convection. So we're going to get strong winds and squally conditions for maybe another four or six hours that will probably settle back down again. Um, as the forecast for tomorrow, those general areas, sort of light to moderate winds.